Uh, let's bow our heads. Lord God, we do thank you for uh, your blessingness, because you are a blessing God. And uh, you bless us with uh, yourself and your very creation. And we're going to talk about that today. We ask your inspiration and guidance and help our minds focus on you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. <clears throat> so, uh, the title for today's sermon is Witness for God as Creator. You know, there are many discussions about God as Creator, and, and so many times they devolve into uh, discussions uh, pro and con, science versus God, God versus science. I don't want to do that today. Uh, I, I want to focus instead today on what the Bible has to say, prim primarily focus on what the Bible has to say about creation. Um, there are Bible assertions about God as creator, and I think it's important that we focus on those. Uh, I'm coming from the perspective that all truth is from God, and that good theology and good science go hand in hand. They actually edify each other, they build each other up. Uh, my theme scripture is uh, Romans 120. Since the creation of the world, God's invisible quality, qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. Uh, what I hope to accomplish is an enhanced appreciation for God as the creator and a deeper appreciation for God's invisible quality, his qualities. I'm having a hard time with that word today. His eternal power and divine nature. We'll consider the biblical witness of God as creator, wonders of God's creation, God's purpose in creation, God's qualities, power, and nature. So, number one, the biblical witness of God as creator. In the beginning. <laughs> Good place to start. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Of course, that's talking about Jesus, as we find out in verse 14. He was with God in the beginning, and through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. So, life comes from Jesus. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's pretty large. In fact, we'll take a look at how huge that is. <laughs> wow. Uh, in Hebrews uh, chapter 1, verses 2 to 3, In the last days he, and this is talking of God the Father, has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe the cosmos, everything that we see. And he sustains all things by his powerful word. By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command. So God commanded the universe to be formed. And what is seen was not made out of what was visible. Hmm. What is seen was not made out of what is visible. So what does that mean? Yes, Bob. The, the spirit that was created out of spirit. It was created out of spirit. Actually, I, I agree. I think that's, I think that's <laughs> accurate. Actually, mo most of the time, I think this is, is interpreted as everything has been, has been made from nothing. But I, 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 I see it as you do, Bob. Um, I, I sort of think that, that God has a, a spiritual pattern for all of creation and and uh, somehow a switch was thrown, and that became physical then. But that's, that's speculation. I, there really isn't anything that totally gives us that. Um, but it's either, it, either it, it, it was made from nothing, which it was, but I think it began in, in God's mind in, as spirit. In the beginning you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. There is much about the God being creator in scripture. And actually, that, that's a great study. We talked about Bible study a while back. 
you know, anytime you see anything about creation, put a red box around it. Or if, you're, if you like blue, put a blue box, or pink, or purple, or, you know. <laughs> it's good to highlight it in your, in your Bibles. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. So, this is from God. It's, it's work was involved in it. Effort was involved in it by God. Day after day, they pour forth speech. They tell us things. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. There's, there's intelligence and wisdom involved in the creation. Isaiah 66, 2. Has not my hand made all these things? There's, so there is a manufacture. There's a, a uh, fabrication involved. A making. In Nehemiah 9.6 You alone are the Lord. You made the heavens. Even the highest heavens. And all their starry host. The earth. And all that is on it. The seas. And all that is in them. You give life to everything. So life comes from God. And the multitudes of heaven worship you. The biblical witness. Life comes from God. Theme scripture. Since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, we already read this, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made. Being understood from what has been made. Let that echo a bit. I don't know if you remember this. I showed you this picture uh, about two years ago. Uh, Wilma and I saw this as we were uh, along uh, the Athabasca River in Jasper National Park in Canada. And it just fascinated me. So, just watch that. Look at that. Well, here it is in a little bit smaller. Look, this is a multiple choice question. So, how did this happen? Choice A, the last flood left the rocks this way. Choice B, it was a spontaneous chance happening. Point C, bored beavers built it. Point D, a person or persons constructed it. Point E, aliens fabricated it. So, what, what is your choice, congregation? D. E, haven't you watched So how, how did we arrive at that answer? Let's go back to the, the, to the possibilities. How did we arrive at the answer that D was right? It's the most logical. The most logical. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This is... This is uh, you know, what the, you know we, you, we consider what does it take to come up with this stone artwork. Uh, we, know that, we know that monkeys, though they have intelligence and they, they do use tools, that is a further stretch for a monkey than anything we've ever seen. So that rules that one out. Uh, beavers know how to build three things, dens, tunnels, and dams. <laughs> They're programmed by God to do that. <laughs> so that rules that one out. We don't know too many alien men running around from flying saucers, right? And I forgot what the other one was. Oh, a spontaneous. Uh, well, we dismissed that one. We know when we see something like that, that effort is involved. Material selection is involved. Let's go back to the picture. Um, material selection is involved. And uh, the making, the construction of it. The designing of it in, in our head, you know, they, whoever did that had to have some vision in their head of what they were wanted to, to create. And let me show you, oh, well, let's not quite get there yet, okay. So this is proof, and we ask why did we make that choice? It's the best explanation for all the available evidence. And that is the kind of proof that is used in court. The best explanation for the evidence. All the evidence is examined. What best explains it? What the evidence indicates. What's logical is what Marie said. The preponderance of evidence. Those are courtroom words. Beyond a reasonable doubt. 
So th this is a kind of proof. It is not scientific proof, but it is a kind of proof we use it all the time. We, we deduce things from the evidence that we have, uh, that we know about. Okay, here. These, are, these were my creation. I did this about four weeks ago at Montana de Oro uh, State Park. I wanted my, in my mind, in my, my, I'm designing this in my mind, I wanted my rock people to have arms. You, you notice, yeah, you'll notice that this, there's really, there's no arms there, there's a hole in the chest. <laughs> Maybe it really isn't a rock person. <laughs> Maybe it's just a rock, a bit of rock out, um, artwork. I wanted mine to have arms, so um, I wanted them to look more humanoid. They're stubby arms. <laughs> I admit, but hey, come along with me. Those are their arms. <laughs> and I, I, gave, I gave these guys names. Intelligence. Purposeful design. And made. <laughs> I'm having a little fun with this. Okay. Point, you know, it, viewing a simple construction of rocks, we know that intelligent design, purpose, and creation were involved. And the best explanation for all that exists, including us as humans, is that God created all that is. Okay, point number two, the wonders of God's creation. Here are some scriptures that, that point to those. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. Their starry host by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the waters of the sea into jars. Called oceans? <laughs> he puts the deep into storehouses. Ow, oh, oceans and lakes, okay. Uh, let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the people of the world revere him. For he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. And Psalm um, uh, 8, verses 3 and 4. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place. This is God doing what he designed to do. Putting things in place. It indicates forethought. It indicates design. It indicates fabrication. What is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings, that you care for them? By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. We actually looked at that one earlier, but I wanted to, I wanted to highlight the universe here this time. So to ponder, how big is the universe? How big is the earth? Well, here, here let's, uh, let's have some, some thoughts here. You know, r traveling by uh, railway, railroad is only about 200 years old. Not even 200 years old. It's like 1825, I think, when the first viable railroad transport began. Before that, it was stagecoaches. Stagecoaches on the Wells Fargo website, they, of course, they've got a lot about stagecoaches. Uh, they, they only averaged five miles per hour, and they would travel 65 miles a day, roughly 65 miles per day. So if you could have taken a, 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 a stagecoach from New York to San Francisco, it would have taken 45 days. And, and today, if we drove, if we drove uh, 250 miles a day, which is about what, what Wilma and I did on our round uh, great circle trip that we took in, uh, two and a half years ago, about 250 miles a day, it would take us 11.6 days to get to, uh, from New York to San Francisco. And that's only 11.7% of the Earth's circumference. You know, uh, air travel has, has compressed our ideas. Uh, well, you guys just uh, flew 14 hours to the Philippines and about 12, 12 and a half hours on the way home, right? Yeah, that's even further than our New Zealand trips. <laughs> it's a long flight. 
Uh, and and the, the stagecoach horses were changed every 12 to 15 miles. They were stagecoach stops. Um, and that would have been like every two or three hours. Our sun's mass, to give you, okay, so we're talking about how, how big the Earth is. But now, let's, let's back up a little, go out a little further. Our sun's mass is 332,946 times greater than the mass of the Earth. The mass of the black hole at the center of galaxy NGC 1277 is 17 trillion times the mass of our sun, or 5 quadrillion 660 trillion <laughs> times the mass of our Earth. To give some idea of even our Earth seems so big to us, but yeah, you know, but the universe is humongous. You know, it takes eight minutes and twenty seconds. That's all it takes for the sunlight to get from the sun to the earth. And that ninety-three or a million miles from sun to earth, it would take eighteen point seven years flying in a seven forty-seven to get to the sun. That's a little bit longer than going to the Philippines <laughs> or New Zealand. <laughs> Scientists recently thought that the universe was 28 trillion light years across, but now they estimate that it is 92 trillion light years across. <clears throat> Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. A God who can create that has all power. He is worthy of being called Almighty God. And is feared above all the gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols. But the Lord made the heavens. This is what the Lord says. Your Redeemer who formed you in the womb. I am the Lord. The maker of all things. Who stretches out the heavens. Who spreads out the earth by myself. So, uh, you know, Marie... Oops, oh, wait, one more here. You created the in, my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame wasn't hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together. Now, since Marie is a perinatal safety specialist and assistant nurse manager, I thought it would be good to have her perspective of the wonders of God's creation of human life. So Marie's going to talk to us about that. Yes, I am. Fearfully and wonderfully made. When does life as human begin? All life comes from previously existing life. As two cells come together and begin to multiply, they form the different kinds of cells, weaving a small but new form that develops and grows into this perfect being and God is watching. Ecclesiastes tells us we can't understand the way of a development of a baby in the womb. Specific chemical processes take place in order to fertilize an egg at just the right time, at just the right place. It takes one full week for it to travel through the fallopian tubes and spe specific energies are required in order to allow fertilization to occur at just the right time. Without those energies, life does not go on. At the point of conception, two nuclei fuse together. This is the beginning of life. Continuous process, the genetic beginning of a unique human being, and this is just the size of a pinhead. Implantation takes nine to 10 days to happen. Babies can die at any stage of this process if all the processes are not in place. 30 hours after conception, the first cell division takes place. These two cells are clones of each other. They divide by 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, and at the same time, it maintains this same overall size with just the multiplication of cells inside. These cells develop and are designed to invade the lining of the womb, where they should be rejected, as our bodies are designed to reject foreign bodies, except at the time of fertilization. 
This unit of cells is implanted and serves as the liver to process food from blood, the GI tract, kidneys to purify, the endocrine glands that make uses of the hormones with the support from the mother, and the protector providing antibodies to keep it safe. It encroaches on the blood vessels and erodes the end of it, creating channels in the cell that become spaces within the cell, and the blood from the eroded vessels go into these channels. Normally, if you cut a vessel, it will bleed and clot. But this one cell does not allow clotting. Otherwise, that would be the end, once again, of this developing cell. The blood of the mother and fetus never mix, but they exist side by side. The placenta is one big cell. It has branches that look like trees. The baby's blood is inside the sap of these branches, and the mother's blood is the wind blowing through the branches. The vein in the umbilical cord carries oxygen to the baby. Two arteries in the umbilical cord carry blood away that is transporting waste material and carbon dioxide. So everything, gases, water, cross the placental barrier, just not the actual blood. Special transporter proteins are required to allow everything to cross, to get glucose for energy and iron to build blood. If only one transferon is held back, and that's what that special protein is, a transferon, that would be the end once again of this process. Mother and baby blood have hemoglobin that carries oxygen to all parts of the body. There is a face-off between these hemoglobins. It turns out the fetal hemoglobin is higher in oxygen content, and the nuclei of the fetal cell go into the mother's blood. But it is excreted rather than causing a clog to the mother's system that would otherwise lead to her death. One half quart of blood flows through the placenta every minute when a baby is born. At birth, the placenta unplugs. At a half quart per minute, the mother would exsanguinate in 10 minutes. But once again, God's plan and miracle, every vessel has a purse string that pulls up and pinches off the blood supply to prevent that from happening. A major miracle in itself. At four weeks gestation, the fetal heart is beating. The nervous system is developing. The spinal cord grows faster than the body. Arches on the sides of this growing embryo develop into ears, inner ears, glands, the throat. At eight weeks, it's called a fetus. All organs are mostly complete. 99% of the muscles are already formed. The umbilical cord itself is a miracle. It has Wharton's jelly that cushions the vessels inside. It allows the fetus so much movement, they do somersaults, twisting and turning. But it keeps it from kinking off, which would once again be the end of this growing cell. If the circulation is cut off, there's no oxygen going to it, no nutrients, and it dies. At 12 weeks, all parts are present. Facial expressions can be seen, and the fetus sucks its thumb. At term, the baby's in position for birth. Look at the pelvis. The baby's head will not fit. There are three joints held by ligaments in the pelvis that have a little give. Special enzymes happen at just the right time to soften those ligaments so the joints can open. Still, the fetal head must turn 90 degrees, 90 degrees to fit. Prior to birth, the blood coming into the right side of the fetal heart flows through a hole in the baby's heart. It's shunting blood to the aorta and circulating through the body, providing nutrients and oxygen for this fetus to grow. It doesn't need to go to the lungs yet. They're not working. Prior to birth, blood has not been flowing through inflated lungs because it's not how the baby gets oxygen. At just the right time, the lung tissue, the lung tissue has tension that holds it stuck together, kind of like cellophane on cellophane, and it stays flat. But just at the right time during gestation, the baby makes a detergent that coats the lungs to allow them to open with the first breath. With the expansion of the lungs, the holes in the heart close off, shunting the blood through the lungs to receive oxygen, and the fully oxygenated Nate, this new baby, as it cries and it's born in this transition into life. All parts of God's fearful and wonderful plan. Wow. Some, I just learned some things I did not know about. 
uh, the, the, the whole bit about the, uh, the lungs and the heart. Wow. It's just a tip Fearfully of the Fearfully and wonderfully mm -hmm. made, yeah. Mm -hmm. what, what one thing most uh, amazes you in, in, this, in the whole process that you see in your work? You know, we don't see all of the early stuff in, in my work because we see the babies when they're born. Um, and it's repetitive, and it's a miracle over again every time a newborn comes out and it cries and it pinks up and there's joy in that family. We all know that there are some exceptions to that, but for the most part, this is the, the um, ultimate miracle and the happiness that it provides to everybody present. It's just a miracle that we as nursing staff get to participate in on a regular basis and, it, and it's never old, it's never old. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, thank you very much, Marie. I appreciate your your input in this. Um, yeah. Um, and I think we can praise God, too. Uh, what are some of the other wonders of human life? Your turn. <laughs> yes, Bob. All these parts work together and become one. Every, every part of it supporting. <clears throat> All the parts work together as one, supporting the one body. Yes. Any other thoughts? Well, let me let me talk about some. You know, you know servo systems uh, it are closed loop systems with with feedback to maintain a given state. A cruise control is a good example. Uh, someplace uh, after the transmission, uh, there are sensors that know how many, you know, that, that sh uh, indicate how many turns that uh, shaft is making. And that can be correlated to uh, when you push the button, okay, this is the speed I want. Well, it knows it has to make that many every, uh, every minute, or it actually is measuring the distance between each of those pulses. And uh, if the distance increases between the, the pulses, the accelerator gets depressed a little more so that you continue on. First time I saw cruise control, I was in, uh, well, let's see, I, I was in my 20s, 26, 27, I guess, something like that. And I, I was amazed. I didn't know such a thing existed. Well, it hadn't before that. You know? <laughs> People take it for granted now. But incredible. A thermostatic uh, temperature controls. You know, we set the thermostat, and uh, if we're in, a, in a, a location like around here, we just need heating primarily, uh, you know, it keeps the house at a certain temperature. It's a servo system. There's feedback that causes something to happen. Autofocus and auto iris on the TV camera, for example. So what are the, some of the servo systems built into human beings? The heartbeat. Automatic. Heartbeat. It's automatic. Breathing. Breathing. Yeah. You know, if we start moving more than normal, when I ride my bike, uh, I start breathing faster, deeper. My heart starts going faster. Increased carbon dioxide levels trigger the increased re respiration. It's interesting that it is not sensing oxygen, it's sensing carbon dioxide, but that's what triggers the increased respiration. Uh, these, these systems are just incredible. And of course, you know, just as, as uh, the TV camera has autofocus and auto iris, ding, we all do, as long as we are sighted in both eyes. Well, no, actually one eye can be autofocus and auto iris too. What am I thinking? <laughs> it's 3D that you get with two eyes. Uh, and temperature increases cause perspiration. And, and that cools us down to keep our temperature at 98.6 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. And it, it temperature decreases, even causes the hairs on our, our, well, all over our body to raise. And that helps trap air closer to the surface. When, when uh, the hairs raise, that's when we get goosebumps. 
And if we go, if we're really cold, then we start shivering. And that increases our temperature. All these are automatic systems that are built into uh, our bodies. Low levels of blood glucose, amino acids and fatty acids, trigger hunger, a hunger response in us so that we eat. And when we eat, that brings those levels back to their normals. I don't know, are there, are there any, now that I've talked about these servo systems, are there any others that come to mind? I'm sure there are many, many, but these are the ones that came to my mind. So what are some of the other wonders of God's creation? We've got a little video. This is Wilma at Gibbs Farm in um, New Zealand feeding a giraffe. Adult giraffes can be 18 feet high. The males can be 18 feet high. Interesting thing about giraffes. You know, our, our blood pressure, our, I mean, our, yeah, our blood pressure is 120 millimeters of mercury over 80. The, the uh, systolic is when the heart pushes. That's the high one. And diastole is the low pressure. Um, if that giraffe had our heart, wherever his heart is, it's down here someplace, the maximum pressure, 120 millimeters of mercury, would get the blood up to about here. He would be dead. He'd never have any blood in his brain. Giraffes have a blood pressure, uh, <clears throat> Uh, or, yeah, uh, 280 over 180 at their hearts. And they have to have that. They have very strong hearts. They have to have that to get the blood up to the head. There's about a 6.8 feet height difference from heart to head in a giraffe. And that's exactly makes up the 160 millimeters of mercury difference between 120 and 280. Ah! Amazing, eh? <laughs> God knew what he was doing. <laughs> All right. So God's purpose in creation. This is what the Lord says. He who created the heavens, he is God. He who fashioned and, and made the earth, he founded it. He did not create it to be empty, but formed it to be inhabited. Formed it to be ha habited, inhabited. Excuse me. There was purpose in the creation of the earth, that it be inhabited. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands and is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. This is Paul uh, talking to the uh, Areopagites in uh, Athens. Uh, from one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. God wanted the earth populated by people. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. God said, let us make mankind in our image. So we're made in God's image, in his likeness, so that we may rule over the earth. God created mankind in his own image, repeated again. That was his purpose. Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. He wanted earth to be inhabited by human beings. We are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works. We are to be the image of God as human beings, with God's love flowing through us to others. Imago Dei, the image of God. We are created and saved for the purpose of, of doing good works, uh, for participating with God in what he's doing. We are created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. So we're created to give God glory. So the point, God made us for a relationship with him. He made us in his image, like him. 
He made us to bring him glory by doing good works. God is God and we are not. We find ourselves a part of, our, of creation and we had nothing to do with it. We can't remember back beyond being what? Two, maybe three years old? Anybody here remember before two years old? Three years old? Four years old? Okay. <laughs> maybe a few nods <laughs> at four. We didn't do it. <laughs> we didn't do it. So let's go back to the theme scripture again. Since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made. This is the Almighty who can create such immense spaces. This is the Almighty, the God of love, who so carefully and wonderfully made us, as Marie pointed out, so beautifully. Yeah, and I, and I agree. Every time I see a newborn, I, I'm amazed at how tiny they, a baby is. It's just, it's a, you know, you, you, you stand back in awe and... and yeah, it's, it's just, it's just it's a, it, is, it is amazing. Um, so what is the response? Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. Creation just... It tells us how wonderful God is. Our response is worship. Because he made all of it. The sea is God's. He made it. His hands formed the dry land. Come, let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker. For he is our God. And we are the people of his pasture. The flock under his care. You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. I think it's very good to be reminded of what Scripture says about God as creator. That's why this message today. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. In him... All things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Jesus, the Father created through Jesus. Jesus is God come for his creation. And we're the pinnacle of that creation. God the Creator has created all things so wondrously for us that we can see in His love. We can see His love manifest in His creation. I have one too many ends there. Uh, he is worthy of our worship. So we've considered the biblical witness of God as Creator, wonders of God's creation, God's purpose in creation, and God's qualities, power, and nature. The Bible gives witness to God as creator. We certainly saw that today. You probably wish I didn't have quite as many Bible verses as I did. But they're there. I wanted to highlight that. The beauty and wonders of creation give witness to God as creator. God is so beautiful in his revealed nature that our only reasonable response is to worship him. The bottom line, God is God. <laughs> 